Bill Boggs. Today I'd like to introduce you to a crucial technical procedure which is becoming the standard of care in operating rooms and continues to gain popularity among surgeons and patients alike. Interoperative neurophysiological monitoring, also known as neuromonitoring, is a simple, minimally invasive and cost-effective tool designed to detect, treat, and prevent potential damage to the nervous system during high-risk medical procedures such as brain, nerve, and spine surgery. Now, here's how it works. A certified monitoring technician assigned to the case is using a unique software program to detect potential injuries that may go unnoticed during that operation. As a result, the operating surgeons obtain the instant feedback that they need to avert or reverse injuries. Neuromonitoring has proven to reduce the occurrence of neurologic damages during surgery from 4% down to 0.05%. Simply put, it ensures patient safety and reduces the physician's liability while preventing medical errors and bringing down skyrocketing healthcare costs. Therefore, the significance of monitoring is undeniable. So we think it's essential that more people become aware of interoperative monitoring and develop a better understanding of this important procedure, its impact on patient safety, and patient outcomes. So we've assembled a panel of medical experts and experienced technicians who are here to share their insights with you into this important development, okay? So here is our panel. We have with us Dr. T.B. Session. He is a board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation. He's also the founder and clinical director of NeuroAlert. And that's a fast growing physician owned healthcare organization in Westchester, New York, providing monitoring services for hospitals and surgeons. Throughout his long and distinguished career in medicine, Dr. Session has firmly established himself as a pioneer in interoperative monitoring. Ms. Rose Auerbach is a neurophysiological technologist. Dr. Anna Carrico is board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation. And Dr. Ezreal Cornell is a brain and spine surgeon assistant clinical professor of neurosurgery at Weill Cornell Medical College. Thank you very much for all being here. Dr. Session, let's begin with you. Can you please explain to us how you got into neuromonitoring and essentially what prompted you to devote so much of your time and your own personal resources to this procedure? Thank you. Um, in 1982, I was uh, asked by one of the attending orthopedic surgeons at uh, Westchester Medical Center to come and monitor complex uh, spine case called scoliosis mm -hmm. uh, correction. And that's how I got into this particular field. I was uh, trained by a professor at uh, New York Medical College, Dr. Audrey Randolph. and. I was able to monitor complex spine cases initially and then went on to develop methods of monitoring other types of cases where nervous system was at risk. So slowly I developed a, a process and a teaching method to instruct uh, other physicians as well as technologists over the years. Right. And um, how was it, how has it evolved and, and changed from from that initial day when you yes. were first there, you know, experiencing it for the first time, and then as you've grown as somebody who's training others, how has the whole practice evolved? The pra the practice has evolved considerably, be uh, mostly from advances in technology, specifically uh, computer technology, where the equipment is readily available on a commercial basis, mm -hmm. off-the-shelf items, and we are now able to take the equipment uh, into the operating room because they are extremely portable, as opposed to in the old days where the machines were pretty big and heavy, so they were not exactly yeah, every, everything portable. Is, everything is reduced. Right, and reducing, everything is yeah. reduced in size. So now the equipment is the size of a laptop, pretty much, right. and therefore we are able to transport this equipment to any and any hospital uh, that requires this kinds of services. 
Is this something that the patient requests or the physician requests or either or? Usually the surgeon who's operating is the one who requests right. uh, this particular service. Let me shift down to Dr. Anna Carrico. From your experience, how does neuromonitoring influence patient outcomes? Well, the early studies done in the 80s showed that you were able to actually monitor the nervous system with electrical impulses. And that any change during the surgery would affect these electrical impulses. Um, with the technologist there and a physician uh, remotely connected, they could convey this information directly to the surgeon and make any changes. Even something as simple as changes in blood pressure mm -hmm. can be detected through this monitoring. So the outcomes, as you mentioned earlier, have, have reduced uh, any damages or, or any uh, patient injuries dramatically. Can, can you describe the, the monitoring, you know, for the a layman watching now or a doctor watching now, sure. describe, who's unfamiliar with this, describe how the process is actually working? Sure. The technologist meets the patient prior to the surgery, usually in the waiting area, and as the patient is brought into the operating room, electrodes are placed. Some are pasted right on the skin, and some, after the patient goes to sleep, are put under the skin. And those electrodes are then connected to the monitoring equipment where electrical signals, uh, small doses of electrical currents are provided to the patient and recorded um, through the spinal system, through the peripheral nerves and the central and then, nervous so what system. what is the, the, the person who's actually doing the monitoring, the, the, the trained technician, what is he looking for? The technician is uh, first establishing a baseline uh, nervous uh, system function for that pr particular patient. Right. Uh, after establishing the baseline, which is basically a numeric value in time it takes for the impulse to go from one place right. to the other. Let me, let me shift it over to Ms. Auerbeck. Yes. You are somebody who does monitor this, correct? Is, yes, I am. So explain what you are doing. You're there at the right. front line looking for what? Right, I'm in the operating room uh, the entire time of the surgery. I, I start out by placing the electrodes on the patient and I record my baseline responses. So that way I can compare back to them for the entire case. And um, I'm just continuously monitoring throughout the entire procedure, comparing back to the baseline responses to see if there's any significant changes. And if there are, then I alert the surgeon immediately. What would you see that would indicate that there is a problem? Just give me one exhibit A. Hopefully it doesn't happen, but right. what? what What's an example of something this is in a way the patient would be protected? An example of this is something we monitor as sensory pathways, where we stimulate the nerve and then we record it from the scalp, from the brain. So when we see a change in amplitude, so we start out with our baseline amplitude of the signal. And if that drops by 50%, then we know that there's a significant change from that patient's baseline. And then what would happen? Then we would, I would tell the surgeon immediately if I saw that, and then the surgeon could interpret that and see. All if, right. So let me mm -hmm. let's let's take the situation yep. where that would happen if we were not monitoring, and you're the surgeon, well, and you, how would you know that was going on? That problem was occurring. That's a great question. That, uh, and I wanted to get to one simple example of that. Mm -hmm. When we operate on the spine, we put people in a prone position where they're lying on their chest and their abdomen. Their arms are stretched out in front of them, and there can be pressure on the nerves in the axilla. And so we, those patients are in that position for a fairly long period of time. And uh, there can be undue pressure on those nerves. And when they're recording that, if they see a change in the amplitude, we know that the arms need to be shifted a little bit. And so while we're operating, the anesthesiologist actually can shift the arm a little bit. It makes a big difference because if we don't do that, sometimes the patient wakes up and they've got tingling in their hands that can last for days or weeks even. Mm -hmm. So it can make a, and, and they can even have weakness for, for a period of time from hours to days. So if we can monitor that and see that there's a change occurring and we position them, then we avoid that, that problem. Mm -hmm. And that's just the, the, sort of the icing on the cake because we monitor, f from what we do, there are three sort of areas in which it's important for us. One is when we're doing brain surgery, such as if we're operating on a tumor at the base of the brain, and we want to see that we're not damaging any of, any of the nerves that are coming out of the brain stem, we do monitoring of those nerves and we can tell if we are affecting those nerves and, and it, it can be very difficult to tell just by looking 
So it's very useful to get this information from that perspective. Then when we're operating on the spinal cord, for instance, if you've got a herniated disc in your neck, you're not seeing the spinal cord. You're operating above the spinal cord. So you don't know if maybe what you're doing could potentially be putting undue pressure on the spinal cord. So if, you, if, if you're being told that there's now a change in the signal, you have to check what you're doing. There could be other reasons. It could be that the blood pressure has changed or that the, the anesthesia is affecting the patient, but, but it tells us, look and see, make sure that what we're doing is not causing undue pressure on the spinal cord. And it's rare that it does happen that we're, we put pressure on the spinal cord, but it's great when it happens to know it and we can change whatever we're doing. Maybe there's a little piece of tissue that's mm. underhanging that we haven't seen that we can now find and pull out. And then the other is when we're doing surgery on the uh, most often on the lumbar spine and nowadays we do more minimally invasive surgery so we're not exposing all of the nerves in the lower back we're trying to limit the sure. amount of tissue we're exposing so we're putting in a lot of hardware we put screws into the spine we put cages into the spine and that's around the nerves and so we want to make sure that we're not injuring those nerves even though we can't see them. And we have ways using radiology techniques. We have now intraoperative CAT scans that we use, but it's great when we have a team like NeuroAlert there that can tell us, oh, that particular nerve is firing, it's being irritated. So we can see, oh, maybe we need to change the trajectory of the screw a millimeter or two. Have you been using this your entire career? Or is it? No, I've been using it now for the past about five years. And how would you say your own personal, when you walk into the operating room now, you know, that you have this tool, how are things different for you? Just in, in psychologically, if he was the man who's got to operate on the brain or the spine or whatever it, it is. It gives me a lot more confidence that what I'm doing is not going to harm the patient, that when the patient wakes up, I'm not going to find that the patient has a weak foot or, yeah. or has numbness in their leg, right. uh, or God forbid can't move their legs. Right. Uh, it, it gives me a lot of confidence that, that I know during the surgery that I've got all the information that I need to make sure the operation goes Good. well. Well, this has been a thorough discussion here. Is there anything you'd like to add to, to, to the, un, you know, the now rapidly becoming informed viewer about yes. NeuroAlert? Uh, there are a couple of things I would like to yes. add. The, the expertise of uh, people like Dr. Anna Carrico and, uh, and, and people like uh, Rose here is extremely helpful, and they work as a team along with the anesthesiologist and the surgeons and, and the neurosurgeons in the operating room. And that team effort is what really helps the patient overall. We don't operate in vacuum. We operate right. together. We, we communicate constantly. And that communication helps the surgeon in terms of navigation, in terms of uh, preventing any, you know, potentially any permanent damage. And we found that teamwork is what gets it done. Rose, when, just what, one last thing here. When you're actually monitoring, are, are you connected? I don't mean connected. Are you communicating with the physician? Is anybody overseeing you, or are you pretty much in charge of the monitoring? No, I'm, I'm overseen the whole time by a remote physician. You so. are overseen by another physician. Okay. Yes, yes, so we I got, am. That's a, a, the technician and then a, another doctor as a, as a backup. It could be, right. doctor, it mm -hmm. could be Dr. Anna Carrico uh, remotely viewing Rosa's screen. Mm -hmm. You've been in that situation, uh, doctor? Oh, that's, that's primarily what I do at this point, it's yes. Good. Overseeing, I connect to her screen immediately when she gets in the operating room all the way through the end of the procedure. And we have constant chats going on the laptop. Exactly. We can pick up the phone as well. Good. So well, you know, it's, a, it's been really interesting. I came into the program knowing not much more than what I read on the script, and I, uh, the, and I hope you've learned as much as I have. So let me see if I thank you very much for the panel. Let me see if I can draw a conclusion here. So why is neuromonitoring so important? Patient safety during complex surgery has always been one of the great concerns of any surgeon. Oftentimes, major medical operations place a nervous system at risk, as we've learned today. That explains why we've seen increased demand in the healthcare market for this useful diagnostic and navigational tool. 
When it comes to influencing patient outcomes, the role, the impact, and the significance of neuromonitoring is undeniable. As an increasing number of healthcare organizations and surgeons of all specialities are starting to incorporate neuromonitoring into surgical procedures. Thank you very much. Go Box.